welcome to the people that are coming in right. now. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to try to soft pedal this first part a little bit and um, let people come in. We've got a lot of a lot of people coming in, but we're going to sort of do a quick little agenda, just a, the, the plan for the call, and then we're going to dig in uh, in about a minute or so with with the uh, with the introduction of the designers, who you can see all on the screen now. Um, so the plan for today is um, uh, we're going <clears> to <throat> do a little bit about Corral. We're going to talk about the design jam, what we've done so far. Uh, what we're going to do today, we're going to see a quick video edit. Um, then we'll launch into designer presentations um, with Q and A following each designer presentation. If we get through that in a timely manner, I'm hoping we can do a group Q and A and um, and then wrap it up. And hopefully, all this can go down in an hour. We'll see. Um, all right, we have got. A lot of people still coming in, but I think I'm going to start because uh, we need to save time for Brian to, to talk. All right, so um, my name is Eric Pfeiffer. I am the founder and creative director at Corral, a design and manufacturing company based in Oakland, California. Uh, today, I'm coming to you from my dining room and also the current Corral World Headquarters. Um, I'm going to try to move through this first part quickly so that we can spend most of our time hearing from uh, the very talented designers you are seeing on the screen with me now. Um, I am pleased to introduce the Corral Design Jam designers. Um, guys, just give a wave as I call you out. We have Brian Graham from California. Can you hear me, Brian? Uh, all right. We've got Kelly Harris-Smith from Massachusetts. Uh, Colin Nori from Ohio, uh, Studio Gorm from Oregon, Chris Adamick from California, Brad Ascalon from New York, and Alyssa Coletti from North Carolina, and Scott Klinker from Michigan. Um, all right, looks like we've got a good crew of people, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig in with that. Um, I'm going to read this first part just because I'll get off track and um, you don't want that. So, um, from the utilitarian spirit of the Shakers to the material innovations of Charles and Ray Eames, American design has long flourished around the globe. I founded Corral in order to collaborate with other American designers to explore and further define an American design ethos for who we are and how we live and work today. What is American design? Like Americans, it is many things, direct and democratic, practical and poetic, forward-looking and optimistic. Designed in the US and made globally, Corral products riff on this creative ethos by blending beauty, utility, and craft. As our name suggests, and as we continue to grow, we are rounding up a diverse stable of creatives from different parts of the country. This expanding group of designers will help Corral explore what American design is today and define an American <clears throat> design voice. Which brings me to why we are here today, which is the Corral Design Jam. Um, you know, myself and the designers, and I'm sure most of you on this call have spent weeks trying to make sense of everything that's going on. Um, trying to understand what is the future of the modern office? What is the future of work? How will the office evolve? Uh, webinars, Zoom calls, Google Hangouts, FaceTime, virtual cocktail hours, and lots of all articles all speculating about the future of the office. Um, I was seeing a lot of talk and speculation, but no one really putting pen to paper and, and, and diving into real ideas. Um, I know it's early and we're still taking in information and, and trying to understand what's happening, but I felt compelled to, to as a designer, to, to want to do something and try to move this conversation forward. Um, Corral was founded on the core principle to create this strong connection uh, to the design community, which is you know, why we're doing this. And, and you know, we did that because we wanted to be able to move quickly and respond to market demands with speed and agility. Uh, well, <laughs> the office and, and how we work just changed overnight. Uh, I never thought Corral would be responding to something like this that um, 
it's, you know, it seemed like a great opportunity to test our abilities. Brian Graham and I were catching up a few Saturday, Saturdays ago about this, and I was lamenting about the many challenges facing the design community and, and how hard it is to stay connected right now. Um, we were kicking around ideas and maybe we do a design charrette that could engage our community, you know, maybe reveal part of the process. And, and we wanted to figure out a way to connect to our community in an authentic way. And we, of course, we got really excited about our ideas as we tend to do. And I left that meeting, you know, just, or that call really fired up. You know, Saturday turns to Sunday, turns to Monday, it's a busy week. It wasn't until Wednesday where I'm like, I have to get off my ass and we have to do something here. And so there's, there's all reasons why you shouldn't do it, but I forgot about all those and, you know, jumped in, wrote a description, flushed out the idea, named it, and immediately reached out to the current Corral designers um, and also a few folks that we have been planning to work with this year. Uh, I set up some calls, made my pitch, uh, which at this point was still a little fuzzy, but, um, you know, these are very busy folks, all running busy studios. And now, you know, additionally, you have the stress of, <laughs> of sheltering in place. Some are now teachers, some are now childcare providers. And so, you know, this is a, a very unique time for everybody. So what I proposed was for everyone is a, a one week design shred around addressing the new challenges we are facing in the workplace. I wanted to, um, I wanted people to put pen to paper and really try to start distilling some of these things that we're hearing and, and you know, can we turn that into something tangible? Uh, and then the other part of it was, would you be willing to do that in a live, <laughs> in front of a live studio audience and, and do it today? Um, which, um, you know, for me in this challenging times, it was really a way to get unstuck. You know, how do we move this forward? And it's almost like design therapy. Uh, the amazing thing about this group was no questions asked. Everyone basically on the spot agreed, I'm in. And, um, you know, it's just awesome to see this willingness to try something new. So with everyone in, it's time to jam. We set up an hour call, which turned into an hour and 40 minute call and, and a far ranging discussion about the future of the office, how will it evolve, you know, physical objects influencing behavioral, new behavioral patterns, pre-vaccine office, post-vaccine office. But one thing that came out of that call is, you know, how do we develop longer term solutions and really think about this, um, you know, not in the next six months. And, you know, and I was seeing a lot of like, you know, we want sneeze guards or we want wider tables and we didn't want to do that knee jerk reaction. So, Great call, finish the call, 40 hours later, reach out independently to each designer and um, had great conversations, talking about their ideas, try, how do we move it forward? It just, it was so much fun, basically jamming, it was great. Um, while that was all going on, Jess Midden, our brand ambassador, was promoting the, the event, but also giving everybody a little peek at, um, you know, who these designers are, which was great to, great to see. Um, so <clears throat> what we did is, or, or <laughs> where we are now is, um, we've got to this call. This is part of the jam. The jam is not over. We're gonna show you a five minute, very hasty edit that um, we put together. That was probably the hardest thing to do here is to take an hour and 40 minutes, <laughs> condense it into less than five. So. Bear with me um, as I share this and um, don't get too critical about this video. So we're gonna see the video and then we're gonna jump into uh, designer presentations. So here we go. Our job is to, to help <clears throat> designers and specifiers create amazing offices and create these places of comfort of joy and now like this other thing that we've got to think about is like taking out the fear. My first thought whenever I get a brief or even confronted with a design problem, as small or big as it might be, is are we asking the right questions here? That's like the first thing I want to think about because there's a reason why we all end up with the same stuff. You know, you end up with categorical solutions, right? Oh, we need this type of side chair to fit in this type of flow and this type of office environment. Instead of backing out and saying, well, what, what, is, what does this business really need or what do these people actually do that necessitates this, this supposed solution? 
And I think the idea that now, you know, it, in, in a crisis moment where we're all just kind of defaulting to our lizard brains and, and, and the amygdala is taking over, we are just basically defaulting to all the solutions we've lived with our entire lives. The whole six feet distance thing, we don't even, like, do we really know that that actually is real? No, I don't think so. I mean, there's people speculating that it's more like 10 to 12 feet, so. Well, it depends, too, but Colin, you were pre-med, right? No, but thank you. <laughs> that was what my mom wanted. Dad, don't be a designer. If you look at an ancillary space in another way, right, it's kind of um, multi-environments in one, right? And I think that this, it, it lends itself to what we're going to, 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 to need, right? Just in a different way. We're gonna actually be able to control the space just as much as we have pre-COVID, post-COVID. It's just gonna be somewhat different. Yeah. Um, you're gonna have different levels of comfort uh, for employees. There's going to be a, a, a kind of social distance versus non-social distance uh, etiquette. Isn't our role to imagine a better future? So instead of just responding and reacting to things that we see popping up now, our role is to really imagine what a better future would be rather than just merely respond to the, the uh, task at hand, right? We need to do that as well. But if we're only responding to those, say, bottom of the barrel, you know, economic bottom line type problems like this six feet, supposed six feet, if, if we think maybe it's more than that, we don't know. How could we? Um, if we're only responding to that, I think we're really missing an opportunity to, to think bigger and dream bigger and maybe have a, a longer lasting impact. One of the big things that as designers we can give back to the people who are working is a sense of agency over their space, right? So right now we're not going to have that choice to, to sit where we want to sit or sit in with who we want. But if we look at it in the near term, stepping out of maybe this, like Eric was saying, in the six month window, we can start to envision products that allow them to have more control over their space. Why do we gather at an office around a table? And I think it's a social thing, right? It's a, it's a human thing. And so maybe the office down the road is even more, uh, it's, it's less about task and more about exchange. I guess what I'm wondering about is, is how to introduce new concepts, new products, however it is, that once all of this sort of wears off or wears down, um, it, or essentially just lifts, you know, how do these, these things or environments not become obsolete or become bad reminders of, of what we've all been going through? As a designer, and, and, and for a lot of us, you know, our, our first kind of like impulse is to um, solve the problem. You know, how can I how can I fix this? Um, but I think it's uh, I think it's worth it to kind of um, stay with the questions um, for a while, uh, and that, and this might be more of the sort of long term thinking to to really sort of begin to process like what what's going to be some of the the real cultural changes that um, that come from this. Because it's a, a really interesting moment right now um, where a lot of our, our sort of um, ideas that we thought were, were stable and, and kind of fixed, uh, we're seeing that there, like, a lot of stuff is up in the air right now. And that's a moment when we can sort of take things apart and put it back together in, in, in very different ways. Okay, like I said, hasty edit. <laughs> But I, hopefully that gave you a little bit of a taste of what that call was about and extremely different, difficult to get it down to a manageable, um, a manageable size. So um, as I mentioned before, uh, each designer is going to have five minutes to present and take, take questions. Um, remember what you're seeing, these are not final concepts. These are, um, you know, this, the beginning of ideas. They are, um, you know, maybe asking more questions or, or presenting possible opportunities. And so don't think, you know, oh, end of call, let's buy that thing. That's not what this is about. This, like I mentioned before, this is the beginning of the process for us. And, and this is usually a hidden process that goes on behind the scenes. And 
this is, I've never done this before. We don't share this part of it. And, um, you know, the world has been turned upside down. So, so is our design process, which is why we're on this call and, and, you know, co-creation and, and gathering of insight from our community, which you're on this call right now is, is a key part to our process. And which is why this is such an important part of the call is to, to get back to having the, that connection to everyone here and being able to show you something right or wrong, good or bad, we, we want to do it out loud. And so uh, with that, I am going to um, get going with our first person. So if you have questions, um, can you keep, there's a, the Q&A at the bottom. If you can stay in that area, I don't know if you've noticed, but we've never done this before and really don't know what we're doing, but we're trying to stay organized here. And Jess is going to help me with the questions. So, um, all right, I'm going to start with uh, Brian Graham. Uh, he is unmuted and, and ready to go. Brian, you good? I am good, unmuted and ready to go. Hey, everybody. Um, so I think uh, what Scott said about kind of staying in the questions in the moment is really where we want to be. And so let me start off by saying that um, I think we've got a ton of information that's coming at us from all over the place. And these are some of the things that just kind of resonated for me. Um, a lot of different ideas, questions, thoughts, assumptions. And we're in a place right now where it's hard for us to observe behavior. So we just have to ask questions. And so for me, the big question is, do we even need the office anymore? Um, and I think the answer for me is we do. Um, and so I've got a couple of thoughts uh, that I wanna share. Uh, maybe there's gonna be a ritual to arrival. Maybe the idea of coming in to a space, either a building or at a floor of a place, and is more about taking your shoes off and going to your inside clothes or inside shoes. Maybe an attendant takes your uh, scarf and coat and basically takes it back in a kind of a coat room that sanitizes it for you. Maybe you're at a communal sink where another attendant is uh, offering you a towel. You know, maybe soap becomes a differentiator like coffee has been for years. Um, maybe there's gonna be a lot less of us at work. Uh, and if that's the case, because we know that things like benching is all tied to linear power elements. If we drop every one of these folks out, maybe the idea is to infill with soft planting or other things that kind of give a little bit more of a sense of humanity and uh, softening to the spaces. Uh, maybe the team that works together stays together. This idea that people are going to really come together, not only from a standpoint of business practice, but also from contact tracing. And so that's going to look very much like we know spaces to be, but it's going to be decentralized services. So you'll have food, you'll have a place to touch down, everything will be kind of together. Um, and then if you can't be in a dedicated space, maybe you need to BYOB or bring your own blotter. This idea of something where all of your wires and your power cords and everything, everything that you need to work is all together and it basically can be self-cleaned, rolled up and taken with you to and fro. Um, and then of course, as Eric said, there's a lot of not so great ideas and I thought I'd share those with you. It seemed to me that I can't tell what people are actually feeling. So I thought if you could get just a little thing that could go up and down on your mask, that could kind of tell you if you were happy or sad. Um, I think somebody shared this before. It seems like a Zoom dicky would be a great thing, right? What happens above 30 inches is for you. What happens below 30 inches, that's, that's for me. And then the sketch that started it all between Eric and I was this idea of taking a toddler baby bumper thing and making that into a place where you could sit or stand. All of everything you needed was around you and you could literally bump into people in the hallway. All right, good to go, Brian. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so, <laughs> so I got a couple, couple questions um, coming in here. Uh, so this idea of ritualizing the, the entrance uh, and exit of your work day. Um, so have you thought about like the, this idea of how do you translate the hospitality like feel into the office, past the entrance so it doesn't feel 
like such an abrupt shift? So that's one question we got here. So have you, yeah, have, I, think, I know I your solutions involve product and spaces a lot, a lot of yeah. time. Yeah, that's just, that's who I am. Uh, being an interior designer that morphed into a furniture designer, I always think about the bigger space and how all the different objects work together. Uh, I think my sketches were really kind of more about like, you know, orange suited people that were really clearly about attendance and such. I would think that in the near term, it's going to look more clinical, but as we transition to maybe a post vaccine world it's going to remain but it's going to look a lot more like walking into a great bath or a terrific spa and it'll be much more of a hospitality feel great um so you know going back to this this image that that we have up on the screen here um, yeah this idea of throwing out you know the the craziest idea possible you know were, did, were you able to draw any um, inspiration from that, you know, that image and also some of the other, the other things you were doing is to, you know, cause I know like Brad was exploring some of that as well, like just going <laughs> way off in one direction and, and, yeah. and maybe pulling something out of it. Was that part of the process for you? Yeah. And that's, to me, that's been the most fun for me is this is almost like going back to school where you're literally just going down ways you don't even know because so much of this is but we typically get a brief, right? And then we make observations and then we can respond. This is so undefined and so open-ended, it almost really causes you to get out of your comfort zone and try things and experiment. And I think when you go into silly ideas like this, which if you remember, it made us both laugh and both think maybe this isn't crazy. Yeah. I think that's really healthy for the creative process, don't you? I do. And that silly little sketch readers, Brian, launched this whole thing. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, all right. Well, <laughs> that is uh, perfect timing because we're basically at the end of five minutes. And the hardest part of all this is keep keeping everybody on track, including me. Um, all right. So, Kelly, uh, you are up next. Um, why don't you, un, I'm going to unmute you if you can um, go ahead and share your screen and uh, you're up. Okay, let's see. Hold on. Oh boy. All right, we good? Yep, you're all set. See that? Okay. All right. So um, since March 13th, we have been at home. That's two months tomorrow. Um, and, you know, Eric, you asked us to think about a lot of things, but I kept thinking about workplace themes over the last few years, this idea of adaptable workplace, co-working, um, hot desking, this resumercial concept of bringing home and hospitality into the office, um, with all of these modular, flexible furniture concepts. Um, and now I find that we're doing exactly the opposite. We are bringing the office into our homes. Uh, so how do we work at home? Uh, this is our 1200 square foot apartment in Boston. I share with my husband and two kids and this is when it was photographed for Dwell several years ago. All this stuff was hidden. Uh, this is the one desk we have in our home. Uh, it's where all the projects, schoolwork, everything, the stuff just piles up. Um, it's also a scooter parking area. This is also where we work, in the bedroom, uh, in the living room, at the dining table, at the kitchen counter. Our bedroom uh, is now a home office, an exercise studio, and a kindergarten classroom. Um, we are finding ourselves hot desking within our own home. Um, so my idea was inspired by a combination of our own home situation and also a bit by this CNN article a friend sent me, uh, this ironing board, and thinking about like something like a changing table or a tuck-in ironing board that can um, be stored and hidden. Um, but also useful as a desk surface. So these are some early sketches, just thinking about a desk that could tuck away, um, thinking about it initially at home, but maybe it could work in the office as well. Um, also modeled them with things uh, from home and demo them later, but um, with the help of my kids and some of the materials that they had, and then um, just started rendering it. So this one is actually modeled off the corner of our bedroom where I'm presenting right now. Um, 
not showing any of the stuff. And uh, it's a bit like a Murphy bed can hide, you know, hide things or close when it's not in use, open when it is in use. Um, it's definitely intended for home, but um, I think it could potentially translate to the office and become part of a larger system, um, something more modular. Um, and I'm showing it here as a system, but you know, just thinking about keeping with Corel's uh, material language, uh, it could be a kit of parts that could be customized for various scenarios. Um, started working on a pegboard system that could also be modular, a movable, multi-use with hooks and cups and shelves. Um, just thinking about different depths too uh, for various sizes of things that might be used. Um, and then how can it work in the office? Um, when workers are likely not to all be there at the same time, you know, splitting shifts and continuing to keep their distance from each other. So maybe only a third of these would actually be open at any given time. Um, maybe there's a rail system that makes them demountable, um, movable. It could, they could be uh, mounted at various heights or within different locations within the office. So people can work, you know, where they want or when they want, you know, with some new guidelines, but whether that's at home or in the office. Um, that's all I got, but let me know what you think. Awesome. Okay. Um, all right. Well, we got time for one question. So it, it's great to see that, um, you know, you've, I know Kelly, you and I have talked about how this might live in the office. And, and so, you know, is there, did you give any thought to, you know, there's only so many walls in the office, you know, had you thought about like, is there some other way to integrate this into the office into a freestanding item at all? Or um, sort of what other applications might the office solution have for it, for this idea? Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that's a possibility. Um, you know, the movable walls are already, I mean, Corral has trellis, could this plug into that? I don't know. But um, you know, there, I think the half height walls and other walls, I mean, this is like potentially along a hallway, but um, yeah, I think moving all that comfy lounge furniture out and putting, <laughs> putting this in, who knows? Uh, awesome. All right. Well, uh, that is our five minute mark. So let's stop uh -huh. that screen share and we're going to go to uh, Colin. You are up, my friend. Awesome. You guys see my screen? Yep. All right. Um, so first off, so I really struggled with this problem, even when um, um, Eric first asked me in, in a sense that I was like, you know, I don't know if I can do this in a week. And I don't mean that like I don't have time, but like I have been, um, and Eric and I have been talking about this for a few weeks, but really swirling in like so many constraints and undefined things and I really applaud you guys for like so far it's been really fun to see what you've done so what I did for myself which I think was important was truly really tried to define the problem for me and define what I think based on the many years that I've been working with this kind of workspace design and kind of trying to let go of those old paradigms because I have a lot of baggage about how things should have been because um, having worked on a lot of projects for products that are existing in there and now we're saying, you know, that's not going to work anymore. So it's a kind of, um, for me, has been a, a reset and, uh, and kind of going back to the basics. So what I want to share with you is like I have this running list of things that are kind of were risk losing during this, um, during the pandemic, during the quarantine, and also kind of going back to work. And just like illustrating a few of them, and, and Brian brought up a really great one earlier, is this idea of reading legible facial expressions, right? Like what are the things that are communication or connection um, and things like that that, are, that we're like losing along the way and how do we kind of get those back um, some of these are product solutions some of these are application things stuff like that so a sense of belonging so for we're also food removed from that that location that headquarters that that place that we have a work community how do we start to bring that back um, even when we have an occupancy of like 30 or 40 percent down from 95 um, one of the ideas we talked about before, which I thought um, is one that's going to continue to go for it, is this idea of agency and autonomy over our spaces. 
Um, as you saw Brad mentioned in the video, that idea that you know, ancillary spaces allow us that flexibility, which we really want. But I think that most offices are not fully set up that way. If you look at the majority, at least in the US, uh, we see a lot of published spaces, which is a lot of ancillary spaces, but there aren't that many because we're still cut in a model of uh, efficiency. So to me, talking about this, this opportunity for designers to protect um, and create new ways the ways we communicate human connection and human control over that. So let's not start with the person um, right there. We go throughout the day, you know, we look at a couple different like frameworks about how we do work. You know, a really basic one to think about is we spend our day shifting through these work states of concentrated work and collaborative work and even contemplative work, which is thinking in more respect, reflective manners. And right now, what we're doing over Zoom and what we're doing with our teams is more cooperating and collaborating, right? So we've kind of lost that aspect of collaboration, um, which is really kind of a real troubling part because it's so, for the last 15 years, group and teamwork have been such a focus um, and collaboration has been written about so much and how we're supposed to do it and all that stuff. And we kind of have lost that. And to me, software is only gonna solve our part of that problem. So to me, when we get back in the office and we're co-located again, we, as designers, really look for those opportunities of how can we get people to really find ways to collaborate again in person. Um, you know, so, someone made the suggestion the other day that everybody has a color marker and they all work on the whiteboard together, right? But we don't ever share markers. And it's like little kind of funny novel things like that that are a little funny to us now, but are a little human in terms of we can be co-located and do that kind of stuff. So, um, Brian brought up this point a minute ago about the, you know, the reception area when you walk in. And there's been this longstanding trend of the office looking to hospitality for products and practices for inspiration. And one of the big problems with that in the past has been that there's this mismatch metric of success for the spaces. So in, in an office environment, we measure success based on performance, individual performance, how efficiently you get stuff done, where your tools are accessed, proximity to people, um, as well as with group performance. But we really measured on how, how, how the, the space is formed. But hospitality, when we talk to the AD committee about hospitality design, it's really about this intended emotional response. So like they want you to be A, calm. They want you to be excited. They want to elicit an emotional response from you. And right now, the office space, as we enter back into it, has this very negative connotation, right? And I think that that's an unspoken thing we need to, as designers, start to come overcome and shift that perception and the negative response that we have and, and shift it to a positive. So how we can kind of get to there. So I think that's a really interesting opportunity um, and one I'm kind of looking forward to exploring. Sorry, right. let me get to the next hey, one. Hey, Colin, I'm going to ask you to pick it up a little bit. We're at the five minute mark. So I'm going to let you go one more minute. All right, no, the last one. Two. Okay. All right, all right, one minute. I can do this. I no questions for Colin. So last thing is this idea of a distributed future. So 10 we have 10 times as many people since October working from home, right? So with that, uh, remote work is really used to be just working from outside the office. And really what we're doing now, we have to shift into this idea of distributed work and not distributed in the sense of process, but really distributed in terms of places. So being able to work at home, like Kelly was just saying, how she's not set up to do that at all, but really being able to work from home work in an office or work community environment and possibly in third spaces as well. And I think that's something that we is not going to shift and not going to change. And they're estimating that 12, 15% of people are permanently going to be working from home of the 165 million. So I think that's important to, you know, provide products for the home office and not just the desk like we have in the office, but also to make that connection back to the workplace. So whether it's a product connection or something like that, making that connection from home back to the uh, workspace. Right. Last thing I want to talk about really quick is outdoor spaces. Um, Colin, this is like the third space. I think it's really going to build up. You cut me off. Really? Uh, I get the first. Go through, go through it quick. I got to get That's to it. that person. Third space, outdoor spaces. I think these are going to be a growing area. They're under leveraged, but they're not workspaces. So we need to get to that. We're going to come back to that point at the end, Colin. So remember that. Forget. Um, That's it. Okay, sorry to do that. I, I, uh, I, I someone's got to be the asshole here. No. Uh, all right. So next up, um, <clears throat> we're going to come back to that. Don't worry. So next up, we've got Studio Gorm. 
John and Juan He. Uh, you guys want to jump in and share? Yeah. Uh, hello. All right, we're going to try a different format. Can you hear us? Uh, yeah, it's a little light. You may want to just lean in just a touch. Okay. Okay, we're going to try sharing um, through PowerPoint. Anyway, um, thanks again, everybody, for having us. Um, and um, one of the things we wanted to really um, talk about and think about around this problem was really thinking about kind of ideas that might last um, and, and maintain durability throughout um, this kind of time. And part of that was looking kind of historically and culturally what kinds of things have worked um, you know, in other places that have kind of maintained their kind of value. Um, you know, and so looking at like issues in say like in Japan, this is the entryway that's very traditional, uh, the Genkan where people come in and take their shoes off. Um, there's very um, specifically delineated spaces where um, you have different materials kind of tell you what is where you're supposed to sit. Um, your outside stuff kind of stays in one area, your inside stuff comes in another area. But to kind of think about how you can make um, these spaces kind of feel a little bit more natural and kind of comfortable. And um, we're still ritualizing the, uh, um, the decon contamination process. Um, the other uh, thing we thought about is the uh, um, natural property of the material. Um, yeah, so like like brass and copper have this oleodynamic effect where um, they actually like break down and kill viruses and bacteria and microbes. Yeah, like uh, something like plastic would have the uh, virus for a um, couple of days, but like and the same as metals and wood and things like that, but like copper would last for four hours. So we, so, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it doesn't, yeah. Hang on, sorry. So uh, we thought about this, uh, um, also one of the inspiration was our previous work years ago, but uh, this is the pack furniture series that we designed uh, years ago, but it's the, uh, um, consists of a, a pack rail and then, um, Tabletop, different sizes of tabletops and different uh, sizes, uh, lengths of the legs can go all the, everything can go all the uh, pack Long rail. rail. Yeah. And uh, people can put together uh, based on, you know, need, the different needs. Um, so we thought about this idea of combining this with the uh, um, sort of like uh, entrance area where you put your belongings all outside and don't bring in any, you know, uh, contaminated objects from uh, from outside. Mm -hmm. So kind of thinking along these lines of like materials and kind of this idea of like rituals of entrance, where you kind of come in, you you know, take off your shoes from your outside shoes to your inside shoes, and take off your jacket. Maybe you have another coat. Um, kind of thinking about this sort of Mister Rogers moment where you kind of um, come in and you have your outside stuff and then you have your inside stuff, but trying to think about how materials and space and kind of objects can kind of have these functional aspects but aren't so like clinical and kind of sterile. Like how can we use materials where you're not just constantly like wiping things down with chemicals but trying to think about natural properties of things and kind of natural arrangements of spaces that allow people to behave in ways that don't elicit sort of anxiety or fear but um, have kind of a comforting kind of quality. So uh, the design is um, consists of wooden uh, peg and then a copper panel, and then uh, you can hang the copper panel into the wooden peg, and you hang your coats or bags that you brought from outside, and then there's also a floor tray made out of copper plate, and then you leave your outside shoes. So system could be easily mounted and installed and then can go. Yeah, so kind of just really thinking about these very simple kind of material solutions that 
you know, could be applied in other areas, but that we thought that this, you know, one kind of moment might be a nice place to kind of explore. And then, you know, you go in, you work, um, maybe by the time you go back out for lunch, um, you know, four hours or five hours later, um, any kind of service contamination has been, you know, naturally potentially removed, you know, from that object or from that material space. So kind of alleviating some of this unnecessary um, additional kind of burden of kind of chemicals and other materials. Awesome. <clears throat> well, guys, thanks for that. Um, everyone seems to be going a little long, so we're going to do less Q&A <laughs> on this, but, um, but thanks for that. I think we do have a couple questions about, and some maybe to think about is, you know, someone's asking about doing this as a freestanding idea um, to take up less wall space. But um, I think, you know, again, hopefully we have a little time at the end, we can circle back on some of those questions. So I'm gonna try to keep this rolling so we have time for everybody. Uh, Chris, you are up next. I'm gonna let you take it away. All right, you guys got me? Yep. Okay, cool. Hi, I'm Chris Adamick coming from uh, Encinitas, California. Um, the working title of my project is Constellation. I have been, um, for the past several years, um, producing uh, designs for uh, collaborative spaces in the office. And my big question with this project um, would be, what happens to we space when we become a series of disconnected individuals? And um, social distancing plays a big role here. And what, you know, how do we start to stitch back together people in the office, especially um, for face-to-face -face collaboration? Um, what kind of tools can we create? Um, the, where the rubber really hits the road for me is tables. This is where we eat together. This is where we might share an espresso together. This is where we have board meetings and, and touch bases. So what happens in this environment when we have to socially distance? So let's pull those chairs back. Um, let's get them at, you know, six and a half feet uh, diameters. People move around. I know it's six feet, but people move. Um, chairs are actually vectors for viruses, and I don't think it's really feasible that we're going to be wiping down um, chairs every, you know, 10 times a day in between meetings. So let's get rid of those chairs and make this a standing height meeting. Um, now that you can kind of see, no one can really reach the power source. We're used to having power kind of at the center of our tables. Um, and who really wants to enlarge this table to 10 feet? Uh, to support three people in a tiny space. Um, not only is that just, it would just be unwieldy and huge, it's just also impossible to clean. It's, it's something that I think uh, we really want to take and give to each individual. Um, so my thought is people might enter the office and kind of expect that they're going to wipe things down the way we, some of us do on airplanes with our trays. So everyone can really wipe down before meeting at a 20 inch uh, cocktail table top, right? And, and if they're really courteous when they leave, they can also wipe it down. Let's give them power individually. Um, and then let's join these tables together. Um, we know that people are kind of magnetically attracted to each other. We really want to um, get close and share uh, information. So let's, uh, let's, let's connect everything here. What you end up with is something like this. There's very little ambiguity about where you might need to stand if you were to enter a meeting or how many people might be required in this type of setting. Um, so especially in the near term when we really do need to keep our distance and we really do need to keep things clean, I think this is a pretty clear uh, signal for that. Um, if you want to plug in your 15 year old Mac laptop, I think it's pretty easy to do here. We can just um, route power right down to uh, floor monuments. Um, what's interesting about this uh, concept is that when we remove the center of the table, we're left with this big open space that we can then fill in with centered pieces. If we're no longer using the center of the table as a place of exchange, um, we can fill it in with plants. Um, I like the idea of removable planters. These this kind of circles kind of uh, play to the overall concept of this um, constellation. And so you could see these little planters being removable for servicing and watering and then uh, replaceable. Um, you can see it's pretty easy to plan with these things. They're kind of like not that much bigger than a, than a three top um, a collaborative table uh, anyway. Uh, there's been a lot of talk in the private office about uh, distancing in terms of layering, um, vertical distancing. Um, this works for the multi-generational office where everyone has different needs and, and also possibly for ADA concerns. So I think that's kind of a cool opportunity. Um, I should point out I'm kind of working off existing archetypes that's, you know, these at the very bottom here, uh, that row kind of um, symbolizes like current state. This is how our offices are built, the spaces we inhabit um, uh, kind of work with these types of applications. So you can see like a media wall on the left, a few different four tops and a five top. How does that play out in this system? That's what the constellations are above. 
Um, when you start to get to bigger uh, applications, things get a little wild, especially with that hexagon in the middle. So look in the upper right, that's my response to what a six top standing height meeting table would be. And I think it looks something like this in plan, which would be super fun to plan with. And I'm sure all my landscape architecture friends would be stoked to you know, plug in different plantings here. Um, but the, the project also looks cool kind of on its own. It has a very sinewy and light character to it, but also a little bit industrial. So I think it's pretty, feels pretty contemporary. I also think it's just a place that my eye is drawn to. Like if I saw this in the office as a place I could go and stand and plug in my laptop and work as this kind of social cue that I'm open for business, people can come talk to me. I think that's a pretty compelling um, proposition. And my real litmus test is, is this better than what we had before? And for me, I'm more drawn to a space like this than I would be just a kind of standard, you know, six top standing height Parsons table. So I think this is pointing the way to something really great and um, hopefully this will continue the conversation forward. So um, that's what I got for you. Thanks guys. Chris, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> that was a good solid five minutes. That was perfect. Um, what I, what, what I like about what you've done here is, is sort of turn the whole idea of a table on its head and, and sort of maybe even a new archetype of what, you know, what a table could be. So great work. Um, thank you for that. We are now going to move on to Brad. You ready? and I will unmute myself now. <laughs> um, first and foremost, I, I thought about this exercise um, by exploring solutions that are useful regardless of this pandemic that we're in. Um, so, you know, products that were applicable prior to COVID and that will be applicable um, after um, COVID is behind us. Um, but, you know, I, I do think that um, I was working with these theories. Um, we will require a, a new social contract um, amongst us, amongst employees, colleagues, that begins with the assumption that we are not at the same comfort levels, um, that we will come with different behaviors and fears, some that are real, some that are imagined, um, that we must respect. Um, and, you know, this, this awareness is part of a culture, um, something that offers employees greater control of and choices for their immediate um, surroundings. And so, we will require new and retrofitted products uh, and practices um, where visual cues are clear and respected in a space um, that could be phased out, in and out, um, depending on necessity and, and perpetuity, and that allow better flexible and ongoing um, personal space and control of that space. So I was working on two different concepts here. Um, the first, um, imagine if we can kind of signal to other um, colleagues that we um, are comfortable with them sitting next to us and working with us and chatting with us, or we are not. Um, so the simplicity of, of a, um, a, some kind of screen, some kind of privacy that allows you uh, to simply turn on or turn off and give each other that visual cue to let you know I can approach you or, 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 um, or rather you can approach me or you cannot approach me. Um, and so it's a very simple kind of idea where here we are isolated, um, whether this is a cafe space or a work environment, and here we are working together. So that comfort level is di dictated by, um, by you. Um, so, you know, in a space, um, properly spaced out, you can see um, how this might play out. Uh, in the workspace, uh, substitute for benching or public library space, et cetera, the same idea, we take this into a larger uh, scale um, and it's something that could be applicable in the same way. We're controlling our space and we're messaging to others. Um, ideally, we want to adapt this into a solution that can be retrofitted into existing furniture, right? Not every office space is going to buy completely, uh, you know, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on re-outfitting re uh, uh, space. So perhaps there's an idea where um, a bracket can simply be um, mounted onto any table and various sizes of this dome can, can um, accomplish the same feat. The second uh, idea I had was, um, this was kind of a, a play on um, the knee-jerk reaction that Eric spoke to earlier. You know, you see so much of the industry already bouncing ideas with regard to plexiglass, right? And um, we want to shield ourselves off from the world. And that's that knee-jerk reaction. So I wanted to play with that and I wanted to, um, kind of explore what that could be in realistic terms and 
what you have here is this private kind of plexi box where um, an employee can come up to their desk, they simply reach behind, there's two grab bars, you pull it up to you, um, and you go to work, you do your thing. Um, but I didn't want this to be a knee-jerk reaction. I think we, as designers, we need to think about the longevity of products. So when this COVID thing is over, what do we do with it? How do we take it to the next kind of phase in, in the world of office space? So to go from something like this um, to ultimately take it into this realm where we have privacy stations that all of us already know and have designed probably for offices, but taking the simple architecture and turning that into a product that, again, doesn't matter whether it's pre-COVID, post-COVID, whatever, it's solving um, that problem. So in a nutshell, that's it. Nice. <clears throat> Thank you, Brad. Um, all right. About five minutes on that. Okay. So we're going to keep this rolling. And next up is Alyssa. All right, can everybody hear me? Yep. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. So I am hoping that this will be okay. Uh, but, but you, okay. So what I decided to focus on for this project was something that was a little bit more um, individually oriented. Um, and I wanted to create an environment, you know, I considered a lot of the, the things that everybody's been talking about as, as far as, you know, how to keep things clean, um, the experience of, getting to work, working at home and everything like that. Um, and so I wanted to create something that you can have, because there is going to be so much at home work, um, something that is similar when you work at home and work at work. So it has to be um, a small enough solution that it's something that could apply in, in both spaces. Um, so the, um, the, some of the, uh, some more objectives were to reduce the visual, audio, and psychological distractions that come with, um, whether it's working from home, you'll, you're going to have a lot of like visual and audio distractions if you've got family at home or other things going on. So how can you really buckle down and, and really get your work done? Um, and then the psychological distractions, that's more oriented toward um, when working at work. Um, so what are some of the psychological distractions, especially in this case, it's, you know, it is, it's COVID, you know, it's, it's germs, we it's trying to stay away from things. So how do we want to do that? We want to, of course, to, you know, be able to block some, you know, block out as much as possible, but um, to also make it really easy to sanitize. Um, pretty much just using our conventional um, methods that we have now, which um, are, you know, wiping down surfaces. So the surfaces have to be, um, they have to stand up to that kind of thing. Um, and also the other thing that I was thinking about is um, I think that there's going to be some, some downsizing a bit. So some offices may start getting smaller and you may need more shareable workspaces um, that, that maybe they're wall mounted, maybe they're on stands or whatever. Um, but maybe since you're working, you know, half your time in the office, you, the rest of your team maybe is in or some of the other team is in um, the other days of the week. So it's, it's a, you don't need quite as much real estate for that. So, um, so I wanted to take, to take up minimal floor space and be um, flexible from that perspective. Um, and then I also wanted it to have additional function when not being actively used. And that's especially for um, when you are uh, <laughs> in, in home use. So kind of the, the, the concept that I was working on was to make something wall mountable, um, side blinders, um, which hey, are also, uh, uh, yeah, share, share your screen. Do what? Share your screen. Is it not sharing? No. Oh. Okay. Is it sharing now? Uh, yep. Okay. Sorry about that. That's all right. So um, I'll just continue with that. Oops. Just a second. Does that turn off screen share? Uh, no. We good? Okay, good. Okay, so um, so I wanted a solution that has some like some kind of side blinders. They can, you know, it can be as a as a blocker to, to distractions. It can be a blocker to um, airborne or airborne particles or anything like that. Um, so easily manufacturable materials. Um, and I also didn't want to have very much storage possibility or what storage there was, it would be temporary. So it could all be very easily clean. 
Um, again, small footprint, um, and then it has a top shelf for personal artifacts. So just a couple of sketches um, starting out, you know, how, how can I use like as, as little, as few parts as possible and take up as little room as possible. So it's this folding desk. It's, it's a similar idea like to, to Kelly's kind of, but um, it's a bit more of a, um, a wall, like I wanted it to be really super minimal. So you can essentially just mount it on the wall um, and place it um, out of the way. It's essentially just uh, if you have, you know, if you have a, a bookshelf or something like that, but then you have a little bit uh, going down below it. So I've got, um, you got a simple cord storage going down behind it. So this one is more of an idea for, um, for use in the home. Um, I don't have the, the blinders in this version of it. You'll see that in the next one. Um, so, but it, it just, it, you've got one that's up here and then one that's down. Um, you've got a bent steel shelf uh, that has magnetic things on it. You, you've got your shelf on the top of it. Um, you can mount, say, like a light for your Zoom calls or you can mount notes or anything like that. So, but lots of flat surfaces, very easy to wipe it all down. Um, and somebody else can use it later. So the more, um, the more office oriented version of it is one that mounts to the wall. It has, it's, uh, when it's folded up, it's kind of like a medicine cabinet almost. Um, so it has some integrated power in it um, that could be hardwired. It could be, you know, uh, you could have like a plug below it or whatever, um, but it is, it's uh, within the, the work surface there. Uh, also still has the, the shelf so you can get a few things out of the way. Um, but what I kept thinking about is like, just how can, I didn't want to have a lot of personal artifacts that would, you know, you, where you could have people's, you know, dirt from the commute to, to you know, accumulate in that area. So that's- Listen, can that's you give of, us, sorry, I hate to interrupt. Can you give us the last slide? Cause we got a, um, we got one more to go and we're well over yep. five on this. All right, so, and then, um, and so you can see like, this is sort of an office application with this. So the six foot apart, um, thing you've got that and uh, so yep just uh, two two small minimal uh, wall mounted things they could also have some uh, you could add some some side um, audio blockers too um, and also uh, a, a mount so it could be freestanding too so stand. all right sorry to scoot you along there uh, I want to get to Scott you're up next so let's say stop your screen share Alyssa and so you can jump in Hello. All right. Uh, hold on. Hold on one second. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. I'm Scott Klinker. I'm calling in from um, Michigan, and I tried to uh, distill my thinking into a a, a, a single proposal, uh, and I was focused on this idea of a, a dignified retrofit. So. We've been working at, at big collective tables for years now in, um, in offices and schools, hotels, cafes, and all that furniture uh, is not going away. So what can we add so it makes uh, a new kind of sense? Uh, so I've designed a system for creating spatial settings on the tabletop. Um, it's about partitioning. It's about a mix of materials and sensory qualities. Uh, it's uh, appropriate for all market verticals, office, healthcare, hospitality, education, and it's for both home and office. Uh, here's a statement of line. It's, uh, it consists of these um, uh, partitions and a couple different materials, ply, acrylic, PET, uh, these mats in, in some kind of antimicrobial uh, fabric to be determined. Uh, there's a side table here that converts into a standing desk and uh, these clips. I'm going to show you how they work. The clips are, are made of uh, aluminum and they can, um, they can uh, hold the partitions uh, together on the tabletop. Uh, the mix of materials is about um, giving options for acoustics and light to come into the space. Uh, this adjustable height side table um, lives on the floor and you can grab it and pull it up to the desk and adjust it um, to, uh, to uh, your working height. That looks something like this. 
And then this is what some of the planning looks like. So uh, the first is a, a more uh, freestyle plan. So it's more user defined. People can, um, can change the position of the paddle, panels as needed. The lower one is a more ordered plan. Maybe that's um, you know, designed by the interior designer in a more kind of fixed pattern. Here's another view of what that could look like. Uh, these mats might be something that are personally owned and you bring with you, clean it yourself and, and you bring your own space, uh, your own clean space. Here's a view from uh, inside. And the same ideas I think could apply well at home where we're trying to divide work, working from living. So I will leave you with uh, that image. Awesome, Scott, thank you for that. Okay, well, um, sorry to some of the design, we had to move that along quickly. Um, I could listen to you guys all day long, as you know that. Um, so we've now gone over, we're just barely over an hour, which we'll wrap up here. But um, thanks, everybody. Amazing work, as always. Um, so, uh, you know, this is not the end of the jam. Um, what this is, is, is really, in a lot of ways, the beginning. So we're going to follow these ideas. And we're, you know, some of them are going to turn into products. And we will <laughs> introduce them to the market. Some of them may fizzle out. Some of them may spark new ideas, but again, what we were sharing and what the designers, you know, sticking their necks out and, and taking a stand did today was to try to move this conversation forward, which I, I just respect tremendously the willingness to do that. So um, I want to also thank everybody. We still have a lot of people with us. Uh, I want to thank everybody for taking some time today. And um, most importantly, I want to thank, uh, just give a heartfelt thank you to the designers who um, <laughs> agreed to join this jam with very little information and, and spent, as you can see, a tremendous amount of time, like really thinking about solutions. And um, more importantly, being willing to share this in a, in a very public way before they're fully baked, um, which is not normal. Um, so, you know, this is a, a challenging time for everybody. And I just have to say the last week was uh, was really special and really lifted me up and and um, I, it just has me feeling really optimistic about the future so cheers to you designers uh, and thank you thank you for for doing this it's really uh, means it means a ton so with that I'm going to uh, wrap wrap this up um, uh, be sure to follow along Jess will continue to follow the process and see where all this thing, where this goes. So with that, uh, have a great rest of your Tuesday and reach out if you need anything. Thanks designers. Thanks Thank Eric. You. Great all being right. on with you guys. Yeah, as always. Great jobs. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.